Well, yet another place I've never been before, um, and we're going to talk about this in a second. We were just talking about it on the way out here. But Colby, when was this very cool trail constructed, and um, you know, and are people using it? Yes, the work started on this trail uh, probably about five years ago. The bridge you guys just came across is put in roughly five years ago. So this trail continues all the way from this point here. We're a mile from the visitor center. It continues this way across the Morris Farm to the coal plantation, all the way to the Junior Reserve tour stop. From this point, it's about three and a half miles of additional trail uh, building off of where we just came from. Good, good. And Colby Stevens, site manager here at Bentonville. And, you know, here we are at Bentonville, you know, just past 156. I just can't even imagine, because having been here at Bentonville 150, what's it going to be like at Bentonville 160 or Bentonville 170? How many, how much more land will be preserved and how much more miles of trails will you have? It's a great time to be here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, in the future, right now we're looking at roughly about 40, 45 acres that are owned, that are uh, currently going on right now. It's being processed. Uh, we also have larger tracks, a 150 acre track that are currently fundraising for. Uh, so, um, you know, we're always growing at Bentonville. COVID was a time for us to kind of assess what's going on. The trust was still involved. We were still open and Bentonville today is still growing thanks to the Battlefield Trust. Yeah, thanks Colby for all the kind words. We'll bring on Derek in just a second, but just to reorient you again, we're still talking about the main Confederate attack on the first day, the main fighting on the first day here. And the Union is bringing troops up, coming up, and really just repelling the Confederates eventually at all points. The Southerners, you know, just maybe if, if in war, you have another half hour and another thousand soldiers. You could have made everything happen, but they don't have that half hour. They don't have those other thousand soldiers. So you have Southerners, I think Rhett's and Elliott's brigades, these are on sort of the Confederate right. Uh, Derek will correct me if I'm wrong. Going through that field, you can see the bright field out there, but you can also see some works, you know, in this area right right before we get there. So some units are going to pivot and engage with them. I'll let Derek talk about that. I'll talk about one of them. One of those units is the 82nd Illinois. I like to talk about them because Company D of the 82nd Illinois is known as the Israelite Company, made up entirely of Jews from Chicago, just like me. So with that, to talk about a little bit about the action, let's bring on Derek. He's the operations manager here at Bentonville. Yeah, so, so we're here on the Reddick Morris Farm. So, so this is kind of the, the Confederate high tide on the uh, uh, first day of battle. The um, uh, Union left wing's 20th Corps is rapidly arriving on the battlefield. Their main trench line is over to my right, facing north. But here comes Red and Elliott's brigades from Tolliver's division attacking from north to south. And they're actually going to be able to go around the 20th Corps line to be able to perhaps take the Federal ar Artillery, which is over, over here to my left, in the flank. But two Enterprise and Regimental commanders start, start talking to each other. They're actually from two separate brigades, 82nd Illinois and the 13th New Jersey. They say, okay, well, why don't we refute the main line of the 20th Corps and turn the opposite opposite direction. And so when, when Elliot and Rhett step out, out in the field, they're actually going to be able to fire in their flanks and they do so from these trenches right here behind me. It's like a whole new battlefield. Thank you so much, Derek. You know, being able to access that part of the battlefield, you understand a little bit more about it. I understood a little bit about this repulse, but I didn't know anything about it. So thanks guys uh, for taking us out here. This is super cool um, stuff to imagine to be able to picture it um, right out here. So yet another place here. Um, to check it out. Look, and you're, you're able to look at it on your map and you can check out your American Battlefield Trust maps um, as well. Hey everybody, here we are. We are still at Bentonville. We still got Chris White behind the camera and we're still with our friends, uh, Derek and Colby here at the Bentonville State Historic Site. And it's a beautiful day and this is a huge battlefield. So we're driving all around to bring you as much as we can. Just know that there's a lot more to see than what we're showing you. Now, when we left you off, we've been talking mostly about the first day so far, okay? You know, where the Confederates try to lash out at portions of uh, the Union Army before the rest gets here. But I told you Howard was on the way and Howard is arriving. And there's going to be a second day to this battle, of course, and a third day to this battle, okay? During the second day specifically, you now have Howard on the scene. Johnston's still here uh, to talk about some of these things and what happens on the second day. Let's bring Derek back on. Derek's the operations manager here at Bentonville. What's the scene? So, so here on the second day of the uh, battle, General Joseph Johnston decides to stay on the Bentonville, um, stay after fighting to a stalemate on the first day. Uh, J Johnston's orders from Robert E. Lee were pretty tough. Uh, Johnston was ordered to keep Sherman occupied in, in eastern North Carolina, pr 
protect Lee's foodstuffs north of Raleigh, and also um, to strike Sherman a blow, uh, knock out a wing if possible. Um, but uh, Lee also tells Johnson, oh, by the way, don't get your army destroyed because that's not helping me either. Uh, Johnson says, why don't I just come up and join you at Petersburg and we can fight Grant, then turn and fight Sherman. Uh, um, Lee, Lee tells Johnson, if you do that, we will both starve. So uh, Johnson has Sherman here. He fought him to a stalemate on the first day, but the problem is uh, Johnson was only fighting the left wing of about 30,000 men on day one. He has now, now Sherman's here with almost 60,000 with the right wing, but Johnson has Sherman in position here. Johnson has a defensive position around Mill Creek Bridge, which is about half a mile to my right over here. Um, he's had to form a horseshoe, um, but his hopes are that if he has trenches along this horseshoe, Sherman is going to attack him, um, leaving to um, per, perhaps another Kennesaw Mountain here at uh, Bentonville. Um, but also be careful what you wish for because you might get it. Um, but on the second day, a lot of, a lot of heavy skirmishing. Um, the um, uh, Confederate cavalry is skirmishing with the right wing as it is arriving to Bentonville to buy time for Johnson's left to form this horseshoe. Um, uh, because of a, a couple aggressive Union regiments see, see a hoax division pull out of trenches south of the Goldsboro Road, they think Johnson is retreating because that's Johnson's reputation. Those guys launch a headlong assault, 14th Michigan, 16th Illinois. Those guys receive a lot of casualties. So there is some, some fighting on the second day, but it's more so skirmish and maneuver, allowing time for Johnson to refute his left and also allowing time for the Union right wing to deploy. Good, good. Thanks, Derek. And, you know, let me just say a couple of things. First of all, in case anybody mentions it, there's a windscreen on this camera. We always have a windscreen on the camera. Sometimes when I go out myself, I don't. But we do. Any wind you hear is through the thick, dead cat, you know, uh, big fuzzy windscreen. So I wanted you to know that. Another thing is here's a map that might show. You, and if you focus on the red parts, you can see Joseph E. Johnston's, uh, you know, position there. And Derek described it as a horseshoe. Now, stay there, Chris. I'm going to turn it upside down. I kind of like the upside down duck theory like you know that doesn't really roll off the tongue but i'm starting to see sort of an upside down duck there uh, do you comment on that but what i really want you to comment on is something i've been thinking about this whole trip and that is that we were at fort fisher and we saw the number seven shaped fortifications or the reverse upside down l which brings to mind the idea of the question mark at uh, uh chickamauga or the inverted v at uh, north anna or the of course the fish hook at gettysburg or the mule shoe at spotsylvania what am i forgetting we'd love to see you put in the comments some of these things about some of the weird shapes and the weird descriptions we used the most famous of which now is of course the upside down duck on the third second and third day at bentonville i'm not even looking at colby and derek now see what's going on now before we move on to this sort of a third day's action and it is intense i'm looking forward to getting there uh you know, uh, Derek already mentioned that there's a bridge over there over Mill Creek. Okay, that's not that far away from here. And let's just, into the wind, let's show it real quick. And we're also looking at the area of Joseph Johnston's headquarters. We're also looking at where the hamlet of Bentonville originally was. And I say hamlet because this was not a thriving metropolis. And as we get back out of the wind then this way, I'll ask either of you guys if you want to talk a little bit about Bentonville before we move on to the third day. Who wants it? Uh, Bentonville was um, was actually a little bit more of a thriving village then than it is now. Now, My now Bentonville's a town, <laughs> township. There was a carriage uh, a carriage shop there in the village of Bentonville and a turpentine distillery. Um, the turpentine distillery was set on fire in the Battle of Aftermath. Whether that was fleeing Confederates or the Federals, we're, we're not certain. But it be, it burns the carriage shop. So Bentonville's manufacturing base base ends. Um, so so the village never really recovers itself from the battle. Okay, good. Now, I'm going to turn this over to Colby, who is the site manager here at Bentonville. You've already seen him. And I, I, I'm going to have to jump in because so many things are happening here at this point. You're eventually going to have a, a Union division arrive on the field to conduct a reconnaissance of some sort. You might even have Sherman express some regret after this battle about all this. You have uh, William J. Hardy allowing his son to get into the battle. I think you've got some repeaters here. You've got cavalry. You've got artillery. We've got infantry. And it's a back and forth fight here so uh colby go for it man <laughs> yeah yeah so all that starts here on day three so day three very quick rundown you have as we said before we have johnson's headquarters this field to my right back behind me the um the uh, back behind me back here this is going to be general moore he brings he brings his entire division through a swamp he's doing some reconnaissance on the federal far right what he finds is he finds general johnson here his left his left flank is in the air is open they do have some guys scattered through here. Mower comes with his whole division. 
General Johnson, again here in this area, he flees back toward the hamlet of Bentonville. While he's fleeing, Hardy, he calls on Hardy uh, to, to uh, bring up everyone he can to stop this massive Union push. The, the main one he's going to turn to is going to be the, the guys from Texas. Uh, the guys who lead this assault is going to be Terry's, Terry's Texas Rangers. In those ranks is going to be Hardy's son, the staff officers with Hardy. Talk about that, the, the, the actual action that took place here. Hardy forms up these Texas Rangers. His son is in the front ranks. The staff officer says Hardy turns back to his left. He sees his son there in the front, and they nod to each other. And that's the last time he's going to see his son before he gets wounded during the actual assault. Hardy and these Texas Rangers, they charge headlong into Mower's men. The guys from Texas talk about, they said that they rode into the enemy and they emptied their navies. So they're talking about they pulled their pistols out and they were fighting just as hard as they could. Now, because of those actions with Hardy, Mower's men, as far as they get, they get just to the edge of the town of Bentonville. We have this, we, we have the, we have the, we have Hardy leading the counterattack. They get pushed back and pretty much that, ends the heavy action here on day on day three now hardy's son uh during the action he is wounded he is shot uh he, he's shot in the stomach um he, and he's gonna die i believe it's uh three days later okay i mean i want to unpack this a little bit more that's great stuff and let me just say that uh, on the way out here chris and i were talking about some of the pronunciations and and colby mentioning mower and i call him mower i even heard colby call him mower before i don't know there's a book called civil war spoken here by quickly that i really uh, enjoy he goes to local people figures how to pronounce things and chris and i were talking about is it van dever or vandiver and each of us did something different and then colby said that he heard that the main uh, authority on the battle mark bradley calls it van dever oh my god so if you struggle with pronunciations, uh, trust me, you're not alone. We still just try to sort of agree on these things. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. We're on the third day's battlefield at Bentonville near the actual town or hamlet of Bentonville. And we're really wrapping things up here. Now for either of you guys here, you just heard Mower's gonna come up here and Hardy's gonna do his best, Johnson and Hardy, to really repulse them and whatnot. But you've got Illinois troops, I think some are really pushing far past Johnston's headquarters. You've got cavalry involved here. Can you unpack a little bit of the most intense part of the fights yeah so so cavalry of course during the civil war doesn't attack entrenched infantry um uh right well ben, bentonville is, is one of those exceptions that proves that rule um uh, confederate cavalry it's just it's just ragtag tag units hardy's trying to organize a greater counter charge but he's sending these individual cavalry units in there to stun mower um as mower's headquarters is uh, is overran mower's gonna send for reinforcements from sherman now, but, but of course there's some, uh, there's an issue here that Sherman had ordered Mower not to bring on a general engagement. Uh, Mower was probably disingenuous here. Uh, he's actually going to advance with over 3,000 3, men towards the Confederate uh, center, the Confederate headquarters. So of course that's going to bring on, on a general engagement. O.O. Uh, o. Howard, commander of the right wing, is willing to send the entire 15th and 17th Corps into a headlong assault to try to finish off Johnston. Sherman though, isn't certain how many men Johnson has. Uh, Sherman's cavalry hasn't been providing him with accurate information. And in fact, uh, Sherman was told that Johnston wasn't even planning on fighting here. He was gonna, he was retreating back to Raleigh. So Sherman's a, is a little bit antsy of maybe uh, triggering another Kennesaw Mountain. He thinks Johnston maybe has over 40,000 men. And if Johnston is staying, it means that Johnston wants him to assault. So Sherman Sherman isn't going to allow, allow, allow Howard um, to support Mower, he's going to pull back. Sherman has also 30,000 reinforcements waiting on him 20, 20 miles to the east over in Goldsboro. So if Sherman can get to Goldsboro and get and get those reinforcements, uh, um, he, his army is going to swell to 90,000 men. Why fight a general engagement here when he's getting reinforcements? But he also doesn't want to leave Johnston behind him in his rear. If for no other reason, then Johnston can claim victory um, in the Battle of Bentonville. Um, but Mower's assault is going to to finally be the influence Johnson needs that that and to tell him that it's time to leave because remember Johnson Johnson has the federal left wing to the west he has the left and the right wing as it merges to the to his center and now he has the right wing to his left so that rain swollen Mill Creek is his only route off the battlefield and he came close to losing that bridge to Mower's assault.
Good, good. And remember, I mean, even by that time, the upside down uh, duck in profile uh, position has even changed. It's constantly changing. So I'm going to bring up one more thing before we, you know, wrap it up and talk about where we're headed next, because all this leads right into it. And Derek just did a great job setting me up. But before that, I'm going to talk about, you know, while mower is attacking, you know, or mower, see, I'm doing it too. Uh, you know, the Confederates are pushing back with everything. And Sherman is sort of, you know, ordering you know, get back here. I didn't authorize this attack. Did Sherman reflect on that later? Yeah, so um, after the battle, in fact, this uh, years after the battle, Sherman wrote that if he could go back during this campaign, one thing he wished he would have done would be to support Mueller during this assault. Now, as Derek was saying, the goal here for Sherman wasn't to crush Johnson. If he wanted to do it, he could have. His goal was to get to Goldsboro. These men here in Goldsboro, we have fresh supplies. We have letters from home. Everything is waiting for us in Goldsboro. So that was the goal. But Sherman did say later in life that he wished he would have supported and the war would have come to an end here instead of a short bit down the road up in Durham at Bennett Place. Good. Whoa, what a, what a perfect segue for me. Um, so we, that will be our next planned stop. Maybe you'll get a good, uh, you know, concise narrative about what happens there from Chris White. Uh, we might perform a dramatic skit for which I'll apologize in advance. And Bennett Place is, you know, going to be the fifth or sixth North Carolina historic site that we've been to. So, um, you know, we're really appreciative of everything we do uh, with the state. Uh, we're full partners in preservation with the state. And these guys here have put up uh, our preserve forever signs. If you start to see those around battlefields, you know, recognizing in some small part the part that you have played in preserving American history today. So to Derek and to Colby and to Chris White behind the camera and to you all, thank you for coming along for our ride to Bentonville and thank you for supporting, of course, battlefield preservation and education.